Take all of me, Jesus, your all. This heart is, is living, living for. Kids can be a little more distracting than you guys, <laughs> but they're definitely, they're, I mean, they're probably more fun than you guys too, so <laughs> I love it. I, maybe, maybe there's a little bit of me that's uh, still a kid. See, uh, you know, it seems like as adults, we get kind of I don't know how to put it. Boring, maybe would be the term. Because kids, 
They're not worried about tomorrow. They're not worried about an upcoming meeting. They're not worried about, like, where's my next meal going to come from? Mom and Dad have that covered. They're not worried, like, uh, am I going to have a house next month? Like, Mom and Dad have that covered. They're just not worried about anything, and so they're just so much more free and so much more enjoyable. We get boring when we get anxious. You know, we have, we have responsibilities to think of that kids don't have, and we get kind of boring. And uh, there's this great quote from Brother Lawrence. He said, the more perfection you desire to have, the more you must rely upon divine grace. And so I think as we grow closer to God, uh, as, as we learn to trust him better, as we learn to trust him more, we become more like kids because now we're not being so anxious about everything because like, I, the more perfection you desire, the more you want to be like Jesus, the more you have to go, wow, I keep, I, every time I try, I fail, miserably fail. I just have to throw myself on the mercies of God. I just have to throw myself at his feet and be like, I need your grace, God. I can't do it. And so the, the more we do that, the less anxiety there is in our hearts because we're, that's it. Like, what, what do you have? Nothing that I know of except Jesus, and that's enough. Uh, so we get to be, that's that childlike faith of just, we're putting everything in what God's doing, like, I don't know what I'm doing. I can't, I can't make myself not sick tomorrow. I'm just going to throw my life at the mercy of God. And then the awesome thing is he's such a perfect father. Um, we can just throw everything, cast your burdens, as Peter says, on Jesus for he cares for you. We can just be like, boom, there's all my cares, there's all my anxiety, and now I get to see life with so much more joy, with more like my kids. Like, when I go out with my daughter, I'm like, I'm trying to be like that. I'm not, I'm not trying to make her like me when we go out, I'm trying to be like that. I'll just follow behind and watch like, oh, dad, look at that, oh, look, at, let's just enjoy life together. Like, man, that's how life was meant to be lived, and that's where the fruit of the Spirit is joy, is peace. It's not, it's not anxiety and boredom. The fruit of the Spirit is like, the most menial thing for kids is just like, wow. This, there was, we went fishing, I went fishing again. This seems like it's becoming a theme of my life. Fishing with my kids, I went with my boys this time. And uh, the best guide ever. Uh, we went, floated the Kligatat, super fun, super awesome time and uh our guide was really good like he set us up good uh zeke caught a steelhead uh noah caught a salmon noah hooked a salmon and they're competing the whole time noah hooked a salmon oh my gosh I'm like i maybe i need to work with my kids a little on this but noah hooks a salmon and he goes oh yeah our guide is like that's a salmon and noah looks over at his brother and he goes suck it zeke like <laughs> so competition is on that salmon got off. The next fish caught was a big old steelhead that Zeke caught. And he looks over at his brother and he's like, ho oh, oh. ho. Oh my word. But the, like, if, uh, if I catch a salmon, when I caught a salmon, I'm like, oh, that was cool. That was fun. When my kids catch it, it's like, I'm the king of the world. They just have so much more joy in everything they do than I do. Like, I want that. I want to live like that. Um, but as we're living life, I think this is the way life was meant to be lived in community, right? So when, when I come here and preach, I was thinking about this last night. I'm like, dude, I'm just telling everybody what my struggles are. These are my struggles. Uh, this is what God's convicting me of and rooting out of my life. And I'm just sharing it with you. I'm just preaching to myself. I'm just preaching to me what God's like, son, what are you doing? You, you, need, to, this, you need to take care of this. Like, oh, okay, I'll share it with everybody. <laughs> um, 
But I'm just sharing it, hoping that it's also relevant to your life. Hebrews 10, 24 says, Let us not forsake the gathering together of believers, as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And I don't know about you guys, but I've, I'm not, I'm not a, I love conspiracy theories. I'm not a huge conspiracy theorist. I'm not like, I figured out when God's coming back. But to me, it looks like the day isn't just approaching. The day is like a freight train about to run us over. So as we see the day approaching, we need to encourage one another and all the more. That's when we, that's where community is so important is because uh, I need help. Sometimes I'm down and I need someone to, to carry me along. Uh, my son uh, wrestles, both of them do, but my oldest son is like, do you think I could be state champ by my senior year? I'm like, dude, you could if, you, if you're willing to put in the work. Yeah, but, but there's one other thing you need. You need somebody else to push you. You can't do it by yourself. Like You can't just be like, all on my own. I'm going to go train myself. I'm going to push myself. I'm going to become a champion. You need a partner. You need somebody when you're feeling down, when you're dragging, when you're like, dude, I'm tired. I don't want to get up. I don't want to push myself. Like, 300 push-ups is too many today. Like, I just want to lay around. Like, no, you need someone who's like, yeah, but you wanted to be a champion, right? You need someone to remind you of that goal. You need someone to remind you of the prize you're working for. Uh, if, if we want to be overcomers in God's kingdom, we need each other. Sometimes I'm going to need to feed off of your energy, of your excitement. Sometimes I'm going to need your testimony of what God's doing in your life to encourage me, to remind me the prize that I'm fighting for, to remind me why, why it's worth being disciplined, why it's worth persevering through trials. Why it's worth persevering through uh, persecution. I'm going to need someone there to remind me of that. Uh, and you might need it too. You might need me sometime to encourage you, to, to remind you what we're fighting for, to remind you what God's doing. And so when I think that life is meant to be lived in community in this way, and this is something... I want to do this well with my kids, with whoever's around me. It's just inviting people into my life of, hey, this is what I'm dealing with. This is how I'm going to deal with it. Like, it's a good idea to sit down with your kids and go, hey, here's our budget. Here's how we set up our budget. Here's why we do it this way. Here's what we want to do with this. Here's, look, here's our goal as a family to bless others, to honor God. So the first thing we do is we set aside our tithe for him. We, we give to God first, like, boom, first fruits, go to him. And so, like, sit down with people, invite people into your life like that. That's, that's what encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching looks like, is I'm going to live my life honestly with those around me, with my children. Like, I'm, I might go, not go into extreme detail with my kids or with all of you, with some of you I will, go into really specific detail about the things that I'm struggling with or where I screwed up. Like, I'll let my kids know in general, hey, I faced this same thing too when they screw up because they inevitably will. Or I faced this same discouragement too and here's how, how, here's how I got through it. Here's what God spoke to me, what he taught me to get through this. We need each other. We need to live in community together and uh, not just complete openness with everyone because Proverbs says to guard our hearts for it's the wellspring of life. You don't throw pearls before swine, as Jesus said, but among brothers, among family, among your kids, among, uh, among your home groups, share, share life together, share struggles together so that you can be encouraged by one another and you can encourage others in turn. Um, just being open with each other about what, is, what God is doing in your heart, in your life, the things that he's teaching you. And that's, 
like that's real life. That's living. That that allows us to go, hey, ooh, ooh, I've got this thing coming up. I'm really worried about it. Like, hey, you know what? God's got this. Be, don't be anxious about anything, but prayer and petition. Present your requests to God, and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. Like, oh yeah, I can live like a kid. I can live like I can live with that joy and wonder of a child because God's got this. And so, but we need to be living in community together for that reason to encourage one another. Um, so uh, let's let's pray as we open up God's Word this morning. Father, thank you so much for your word. Um, Lord, help us not to take it for granted, but to uh, just to remember how much you loved us and you proved it by revealing yourself to us in this word. God, you want to be in relationship with us so, so much. You want, you want relationship with us so much that you wrote down for us your heart. You showed us your heart that you're a relational God, that you're not distant, that we can know you, that we can come before your throne, that we can be called sons of God, that we can inherit your kingdom alongside Jesus because of the work that Jesus did on the cross. God, you became a man and died for us so that we could be in relationship with you. And we thank you for your word and we don't take it for granted. We honor your word this morning as, as we go to to read and to learn about you. Um, just bless your word, Lord, and, and don't let it return void. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hebrews 12, 2. We've talked about this before. It says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And we've talked about this before. Like, what does it mean to fix your eyes on Jesus? Um, and then, I guess over the past few weeks, God's kind of been working on me a little bit. I don't know that I'm, I'm all the way there. I don't know that I've fully... Uh, embraced this message, but he's working on me. Uh, as I was thinking about that, what does it mean to fix our eyes on Jesus? I was reminded of an old story, a story in Genesis, where the focus got distracted from what God said, it got distracted from the salvation that God had laid before them. So I want to go there with you guys in Genesis, starting in Genesis chapter 13. Verses 10 and 11. So here's the deal. Abraham and his nephew Lot and all of their servants and all of their flocks, they're all hanging out together. And it gets too big. There's too many. There's too much, too much of God's blessing in that camp. And so Abraham, who was promised by God, who was given the promised land by God, Abraham says to his nephew Lot, this is, I, I love this, so much faith in Abraham. He says, you pick whatever you want. If you go to the left, I'll go right. If you go right, I'll go left. Like, it's, the land isn't big enough for both of us, so you take first choice. Abraham knew where his blessing came from. But Lot, he got a little bit distracted here. Uh, in verse 10, it says, And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go toward Zoar. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. And so Lot, Abraham says, God's the one who blesses me. You take first pick, 
Where, whichever way I go, God's going to bless me. It doesn't matter. I don't care. God's given me this promise. Abraham's faith was in God. Lot looked at the land and was like, I could make something happen with that. That looks good down there. That looks like a rich land. I want that. Um, and that was the <coughs> start of his troubles. <laughs> Going to Jumping up to Genesis 19. Actually, if you see back in 13, he says, uh, Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent, even as far as Sodom. So Sodom was like the very far, and he's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that land, and Sodom's right over here, and Lot pitched his tent in that good land, even as far as Sodom. So it sounds like Sodom was like on the outskirts, and this is Lot. Is in Genesis chapter 19, we pick up here, verse 1, he says, uh, that Now two, the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. His, he ended up on the farthest, the farthest away from God's promise that he could. But that was a good land. And he was like, I can make something good out of this. I can get rich here. And he was. He was, he was sitting in the gates. Now the gates of the city were where the prominent men, the businessmen, the judges sat in the gates of the city. And people would come to those who had they had honor and respect. If you're sitting in the gates of the city, you're one of the elders. Like, so Sodom, or so Lot ended up there. He's like, I can make myself rich in this plane. And he did. He, he was rich. He was sitting in the gates of the city. He had respect and influence there. But then in verse 9, these, oh, let's finish up with the two angels. So they come in, and when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and he said, Hear now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. And they said, No, we'll spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly, so they turned into him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. So Lot takes these, these men in. And Lot was a righteous man. The scripture bears that out, is that he was, he was tortured in his soul by the evil that was going on in Sodom. But he still lived there. He still made money there. He, was, he still had influence. He still had wealth. He still had, he still had respect and position there. Uh, until this, the men of the city come up and they're like, send those dudes out to us. We're going to do terrible things to them. Uh, and Lot said, no, no, no. No, no. That's not, you, you can't do that to, to a visitor. You can't, that's, that's so wrong, you guys. And this is what they said. Then the, the men of the city, they said, stand back in verse 9. Then they said, this one came in to stay here. And he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break down the door. See, Lot had respect and influence until he challenged the culture. Right. America is a great country. You can, you can become wealthy. You can have respect and influence until you challenge the culture, until you challenge the, the unspoken rules of our society, until you say, wait, 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 that's not right. And then these men, they were trying to pull the ultimate cancel. This was the ultimate cancel culture. They're like, oh, we're going to deal worse with you than with them. They were going to kill him. That's, uh, that's the ultimate cancel right there. Um, so he had, he had respect and influence until he took a stand against their perverse culture, the perversity, the wrong things. Then they remembered, like he'd been there a long time, Lot had. He'd been there long enough to 
rise up into the ranks to sit at the city gates as a judge, as soon as he challenged their perverse culture, they're like, nah, we're canceling you. We're going to we're going to kill you in, in terrible ways. So the, the two angels then struck all the men blind. They're like, because these angels, they'd come to Abraham earlier, and God, God and these two angels, and he talk, they talked to Abraham, and God told Abraham, I'm going to destroy the city. And Abraham's like, what if there's 50 righteous men in the city? I was like, no, no, I'm not going to destroy the righteous with the wicked. He's like, well, well, if there's all the way down to, I think, 10. For the sake of 10, God said, I won't destroy it. And these two angels show up. And they're like, all right, we've seen enough. There's one. There's one righteous man in the city. It's Lot. And so the men said to Lot in verse 12, have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who had married his daughters and said, get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. So it came to pass when they had brought them outside that he said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. And I, like, you, you read that and go, why was he lingering at the city? Well, Lot had sons-in-laws. That means he had married daughters. His married daughters wouldn't be virgins. He had two virgin daughters. That means he had children still in the city. I probably would have lingered too. I'm not going to hold that against him very harshly. But um, these men took him and they said, look, Lot, they, they took him by the hand. I, I need to be taken by the hand sometimes. Sometimes I need God to take me by the hand and be like, look, here's the path. So they took Lot and his wife and his two daughters who were still in his household under his care, who he was still responsible for. And he took them, the, the angels took them, and by the hand, dragged them out of the city and said, go to the mountains, don't look back. Those mountains there, that's the path to salvation. They set them right on that path to salvation. They're like, here's where salvation is. Head that way, don't look back. And then... Lot negotiates with him a little bit. He's like, hold on. You can't just send me to the mountains. Look, there's this little town. Can I go to that town? And they're like, we won't overthrow that town for your sake. And so go to that town. Just get out of here. There's your path to salvation. There's your calling. Here's the, here's the path that you need to travel. Stick to this road. Don't look back. My salvation is there. If you stay here, you're going to get destroyed Move. Don't look back. There's, there's your salvation. There's your calling. There's your purpose. You've got to get there. You've got to get your family there to protect them. It says in, in verse 23, the sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar, this little town. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So he overthrew those cities all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. See, when God sets us on a path, 
to salvation, we can't look back. When God has set a calling and a direction before you, you can't look back and wish for what was lost. Lot, Lot had a lot in that city. He had, in, he had wealth and influence. He had children. But God said, go this way. Don't look back. Don't look back at it. We can't look back and wish for the comforts that exist in mediocrity, that exist in, in a, a, a mediocre Christian life, that exist in just fire insurance. We can't look back and wish for that comfort when God's set us on a path, when he's given us a calling, when he's called us to wake up, to stop, to stop sleeping, to wake up and to be an influence in our world. When he's called us to wake up and lead our families to Christ, we can't wish for the old days of, of taking it easy. Jesus said, if we're not willing to give up homes, families, fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers, children, wives, even our own life for the sake of the gospel, we're not worthy to follow him. He's, he tells us, just like these angels told Lot, don't look back. Jesus said, don't look back. If you're not willing to give up everything, then you're not really worthy to be my disciples. Because Jesus came and gave up everything. Absolutely everything. He gave up his father he gave up his authority. He gave up his place in heaven. He gave up all of his comfort. We don't get to look back and wish for the comfort that was lost because like Jesus said, if, you don't, if you're not willing to give it all up, you're not really worthy to be my disciples because we do give up something. It's not just, uh, I mean, we get the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We get love, joy, peace, we get to inherit God's kingdom with Jesus if we also suffer with him. That's the little addendum on there that is hard that we don't really love that much, right? Like, yeah, we get to, we get to participate with Christ as co-heirs of his kingdom uh, if, if we suffer with him so that we can also be raised to life with him. So, but we lose something. You have to lose something to follow Christ. You have to give up, well, everything. You have to be ready to give up everything, which doesn't mean that God's going to take everything away from you. Like, God wants you to be good fathers. God wants you to be good mothers. God wants you to be good husbands and wives. He wants you to be successful businessmen. He wants you to be good employers. He wants you to be good employees. He wants to bless you. But we have to sever our emotional attachment to all of those things where we say, I'm not willing to give that up. Where we're looking back at what was instead of forward, instead of fixing our eyes on Christ. And he's, uh, like I said, I, I'm not, I don't know that I'm, I'm fully here yet. I don't know that I'm, I'm fully there yet. Um, because I sometimes find myself regretting or wishing for something that's lost. Like, well, I liked that. That was awesome. That was comfortable. That was easier. Why can't I just do that? Why can't I just keep being that? Why can't I just keep living that way? God, why are you asking me to give up that? It's, it's entertaining. I deserve to decompress at the end of the day. Why are you asking me to give that up? I find myself in that situation sometimes. And, and this is just what God's working on in me is, look, here it is. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Don't look back. Just like they told Lot, don't look back. And the consequences for Lot's wife for looking back were horrific. She lost everything because she looked back, because she longed for those comforts 
that she, that God said, you got to give these up if you want to be saved. You got to give that up if you want to be saved. And she was like, but I don't want to give that up. Like, well, I'm done. Lost everything because of it. So I'm learning that fixing my eyes means I don't get to look back with longing at what was. But I get to look with expectation toward the cross, toward what Jesus is doing, toward the calling that he's called all of us to. We get to look forward. That's what when we give up looking back at the comforts and all the things that we thought we wanted or all the ways that we thought we could satisfy ourselves or make ourselves comfortable or please ourselves, when we go, all right, I'll give up all of my attempts to make myself happy, I'm going to look at Jesus. Then we, we gain a calling. Then we gain a purpose and a direction. Then we gain a hope for the future. Because... All those things that make you feel good, that bring you comfort, that are just a little uh, comfort food for you, all of those things are just here and now. They're, they just they make you feel good right now. When we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, we're looking into the future. We have hope for what he's doing. We have a vision. We have a purpose that's greater than any suffering that we'll confront. And then we can stand up, we can stand up under anything because we know, hey, Christ has called us here. We can not look back. We can go, eh, like Paul said, whatever I had, whatever I lost, I consider it nothing compared with the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus. That's what Paul went ahead and told us, like, hey, guys, it's worth it. That's garbage. Everything that I had, all the influence, all the wealth, all the respect of everyone else is garbage compared to the greatness of knowing Jesus, compared to the greatness of fixing our eyes on Jesus, which means we don't look back and regret what was lost. We look forward to what Christ has, to that calling that he's put in your heart. Like, let that wake up. Let that wake up in you uh, if, the, if the worship team would come forward. I just want to challenge, I just want to challenge you guys because I'll be honest with you, uh, if I'm being challenged, you're going to be challenged too because it's not fair that I'm in this. I'm not in this by myself. You're here. So, like, you're going with me whether you like it or not. <laughs> um, I just want to challenge you guys to take Lot's example in this situation. We, we can become really comfortable in our culture and our society. We can become really comfortable with, it's really easy to be comfortable in America, okay, with our, with our wealth and our affluence, with all of the great things the prosperity that this country has provided, it's easy to get complacent. It's easy to get comfortable. But God's called us, set us on a path of salvation and said, don't look back. So I want, I want to challenge you guys to consider that, to look at your own lives and go, what am I emotionally attached to that's holding me back from fixing my eyes on Jesus? So um, you guys to think about that and talk to God about that, and let him work on you, and I'll let him work on me with that this morning. Father God, you called us for such a time as this, and you want us to fix our eyes on you, Lord. Help us to do that on a, on a daily sacrifice of laying our lives down and picking up your cross, Lord, as we uh, traverse this life, Lord. Give us the strength and the the ability, Lord, that only you can, and help us to keep our, uh, keep us remain in you, Father, and keep our eyes fixated on you, Lord. We love you. We give you praise, and we thank you for your goodness and your uh, mercy in each and every one of our lives, Lord. In Jesus' name.
Amen. There's no space that is love can reach. There's no place where we can find peace. There's no end to amazing grace. Take me in with your arms spread wide. Go and take me in like an orphan child. Never let go. And no one else will do And nothing else could take my place To feel the warmth of your embrace Oh, help me find a way No one.